This video will provide an insight into the philosophy of K-pop and how it functions to maintain its prominence across the world. The first part of this analysis will focus on the role of the idols within the industry, the second part will focus on cultural influences broadly, and the final part of this analysis will incorporate the work of French philosopher Jean Baudrillard into the dynamic between idols and consumers. I also highly recommend you watch my last two videos on the cultural and systemic differences between South Korean and North Korean idols to acquire a greater understanding of how idols work, although it is not a necessary requirement for watching this video. This video is also not a condemnation of K-pop as a music genre, I only seek to explore some of the more concealed elements of the K-pop industry, which should hopefully be of use to the viewer in better understanding the K-pop industry. As an exportation industry of the post-industrial neoliberal service economy, K-pop has been shaped and fashioned to the consumer tastes of audiences both domestically and internationally. K-pop idols in particular are established as spectacles and commodities, crafted by state and private partnership to proliferate popular culture as an economic and commercial profiteering strategy. Idols are forged through an intensive corporate practice of training and performing that oversees musical, aesthetic and performative modes of pop culture in attempts to appeal to a widest range of diverse audiences across the world. The fusion of modern technology and pop culture are central to the deployment of K-pop globally, rendering the K-pop experience across a wide variety of social media platforms. In many instances, the aesthetic appeal of K-pop is primary to its presentation, with music being secondary. Fundamental to the image of idols is the exquisite presentations of gender roles and beauty standards, with the industry administering a large variety of feminine and masculine expressions, most suitable to the images of idols who will be received well by a largely female fanbase. Both male and female K-pop idols are subject to a multiplicity of beauty standards, with some standards being more aligned with the spectacle of reserved Confucian formality, and other standards being more aligned with the spectacles of cuteness or, more exceedingly, hypersexuality. Male idol beauty standards in many cases also overlap with typically associated feminine standards, although the standards of female idols are strictly reserved as traditionally feminine. Moreover, K-pop idols in and of themselves are nothing without their fan bases who rejoice in their public displays and devotely listen to the idol's music. The role of the fan is to act as an intermediary between the idols as individuals and the idols as celebrity figures involved in the pop culture economy. The fan's participation in the realm of K-pop is one of voluntary action based on an emotional attachment to the idols and their music. <laughs> who in return provide consumer outlets to the fans. A streamlined connection of perpetual engagement between the idols and the fans is essential for the user-generated cultural and economic growth of groups and individual idols, as fans conclusively bolster the content and surplus value of the idols as engagement intensifies. Without fan support, the idols and their music is rendered defunct and abolished. The presentation of female K-pop idols finds itself typically intertwined in notions of a post-feminist society, even as K-pop attempts to be as apolitical as possible. Female idols are presented as agents of individual choice, freedom, glamour and feminine success in a hyper-competitive capitalist economy. Whilst this might be an idealistic image for the public to aspire towards, it is contrarily a manufactured presentation of how private enterprises envision consumer society. Reports investigating the treatment of idols and aspiring idols under training exercises notably extinguish any arguments implying the existence of individual determination or free lifestyle choices under the heavy boot of the K-pop industry. The spectacle of a post-feminist femininity arises from a dialectic antagonism between the K-pop industry's attempts to appeal to growing trends of social progressiveness, whilst at the same time preserve the underlying Confucian capitalist structure which has prevailed among many powerful South Korean corporations. The synthesis of this antagonism results in a femininity which expresses itself liberally on stage, but still nonetheless conforms to Confucian methods of corporate instruction off stage. Furthermore, spectacles of feminine success are materialized into idealistic visions of idol success, which are merely consented by private corporations, who can absolve the idols of their celebrity status at any given moment or time if they see it necessary. The consuming fans are pacified in an idealized association with the idol's perceived sense of success and liberation, and therefore pacified in the real world of economic empowerment and mobility. In this sense, K-pop crucially serves the order of capitalist societies, although this is not the only way K-pop sustains capitalism, as consuming fans will either consciously or more likely subconsciously align consumer choices based on a stimulation of idol association. 
consumers will associate commodities with what has been visually attributed with K-pop idols, whether it be cosmetic items, fashion, luxury goods, or plastic surgery, which is more likely the case in core East Asian societies, where the image of idols is directly embedded into public displays of commercial advertisement. It is certainly no coincidence that South Korea has one of the largest fashion and cosmetic industries, along with major metropolitan cities that are geared towards the economies of mass consumerism. Unique to K-pop is its broad displays of various cultural forms, from the material culture as seen visually presented on or amongst the idols, to the lingual diversity of particular songs. The Koreanness of K-pop has notably been diluted down to the use of Korean faces, beauty standards and language. But even then, these are not necessarily total requirements for the viability of idols, with idols ranging from diverse nationalities, ethnicities and beauty standards. The existence of these differences, however, does not negate the status of K-pop being associated with such idols. Rather, the singular acceptance of such diversification in the K-pop industry only shows the willingness of the industry to commercialize and absorb cultural differences into the hegemonic blend of Korean pop culture. Cultural influences on contemporary Korean musical forms can be traced back to the Japanese colonial period and to the Korean War where first Japanese and later American musical styles would come to influence the ways Korean music was cultivated. The Kim Sisters Band, which was established during the 1950s and performed for American soldiers, was a direct replica of already existing American Motown girl groups. Later American cultural imports in the latter half of the 20th century would also come to facilitate the early origins of the K-pop musical genre as seen in the band Soteji and Boys, or Soteji wa Idol in Korean. In their song named Hayoga, you can hear the multivaried influences of hip hop, rap, heavy metal, and traditional Korean instruments. The Americanized presentation of the idols in this music video was also unconventional for its time in the early 90s, and the Sotaji and Boys group were largely despised from the elderly generation who believed they were promoting degenerate behavior. Ironically, this supposed cultural degeneracy would later come to define the popularity of the K-pop industry and growth of the South Korean economy in the early 21st century. From the source of K-pop itself comes the potential for a multiplicity of presentational and musical styles. In contemporary K-pop today, so long as the form and structure of the idol is withheld, pushing boundaries beyond what is typically attributed to K-pop and K-pop idols will be experimented, particularly if companies can drive new avenues for profit. Drives for cultural hybridity are also reflected in the global reach of the K-pop market, with companies appealing to a diverse range of international audiences. Idols themselves are also not bound to the borders of South Korea, with many finding themselves operational across a multitude of nations and cities, particularly such idols who have connections to various luxury corporations throughout both the East and the West. Although attempts at cultural diversification have not come without criticism, with some fans accusing idols of engaging in cultural appropriation and cultural fetishism. On the other hand, many have suggested cultural diversification has successfully challenged cultural norms and contributed to a sense of globalization, where idols and the Korean public at large are steadily becoming more infused with a type of multiculture of sorts, even if it's not entirely organic. Both positions regarding cultural diversity are notably contested. The K-pop industry's diverse, kaleidoscopic presentation can principally be found in its appeals to modernity, as companies push the aesthetic boundaries of the idol beyond that of the average person's expressive capabilities, and ultimately transforms the idol beyond that of a typical celebrity and into a profitable piece of art. French sociologist and philosopher Jean Baudrillard analyzed in his book Simulacra and Simulation the role that images play in contemporary society and the way that reality is mediated by these images. Baudrillard found that within consumer societies, the distinction between what is real and artificial becomes blurred into what is known as hyperreality. Examples of this can be seen within Disneyland, which is based on actual 19th century German architecture, McDonald's commercials, 
or in the ways in which people can edit photos of themselves for social media. Signs and images in this sense become powerful mechanisms of control and dictate to the public the ways in which such images be interpreted. The K-pop industry itself is directly aligned with this notion of hyper-reality. Fans are led to believe they experience an authentic and self-cultivated version of the idol, when in truth, top-down control of the idols from the companies they are associated with fundamentally dictate the vision we have of the idols. The dynamic between the fan and the idol is one largely filtered down by media platforms, for which other contributing factors influence the ways in which the idols are perceived. In most instances, the overwhelming spectacle of the idol is enough to establish a robust sense of authenticity. The aesthetic presentation of the idol becomes the authentic self-expression of the idol. The idol in this respect is the aesthetic and the aesthetic is the idol. The paramount expression of the idol is when they are on stage engaging all modes of the spectacle as the live performance encompasses the model, the fashion icon, the musician, artist and celebrity as an empowered symbol of modernity. At a fundamental level, however, fans are only led to believe they know the authentic self of the idol. The vision the mass public has of the idol is no more than the vision of the company, and it is the company who knows the most about the idol's authentic self. The public only has a surface level understanding of who the idols really are, and how they really feel, as the fans are convinced that the idol's authenticity is sustained in their aesthetic appearance. Although in actual fact, we can never truly know how an idol is feeling. When an idol breaks with the media-sustained image, it can result in serious backlash, causing the company or the law itself to intervene to efficiently remove the idol from a now broken spotlight. Hyperreality and simulation is a prerequisite for the K-pop industry to flourish reliably. Despite the wealthy success of idols, we should keep in mind that beyond the simulation of the idol is someone who is equally, if not more, susceptible to depression and anxiety. Is the smile of the idol really the authentic expression of the idol self? Or is it rather the smile as ordained by the company affiliated with the idol? Lifestyle choices from dietary habits, fashion, relationships, surgical enhancement, work ethic and sexual behaviors are all regulated to varying extents by the company. It is then the company who repackages this idol way of life back onto the fans as authentic means of becoming an idol. The idol is of course the very product it is trying to sell, along with the modes in which a consumer society and consumer conformity and predictability can be efficiently sustained. Idols not only promote the sale of goods and services, but actually are produced by the goods and services that they sell. Rather than idols selling products, we have a system of commodities that is selling idols. By focusing on the idol alone, one loses sight of the network of relations that go into producing the idol. The idol then is but a node in the network of the capitalist system of commodities that links producers to consumers.